بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين محمد الأمين أما بعد. Today I'm going to talk about a very important subject and for people that are interested in understanding how to think about Islamic eschatology and how to navigate the world of events around us, especially in regards to conspiracy theories or conspiracy truths. Um, how do we think Islamically? Right? Because I think uh, this is very, very important to understand. So I'm going to try to give a, a summary of summaries in the next uh, minutes that we have on this subject. And we're going to take a few things as a study case. And I'm going to talk about specifically maybe from an experiential perspective of myself of like, okay, how did I understand certain things? So, <clears throat> and what I would like is in the comment section uh, for those of you that want to, can also uh, jot down in the comments, comment section things that you would add to what I have stated as a measurement of uh, the relationship between Islamic eschatology and how do you know a conspiracy is a real conspiracy or a fake conspiracy. Okay, so that is a very important topic. Uh, and if Allah wills, I might write a book on that. Uh, we'll see, inshallah. So, I put down some notes, uh, Islamic eschatology, which is the prophecies of the Prophet ﷺ and the Qur'an on the events that are going to transpire. And the Prophet already told us they're going to happen, so they're going to happen. That's a whole field in itself. How do you know what is authentic, How what is not authentic? Inshallah, one day we'll go into that, specifically looking at the traditions of the Prophet and understanding hadith literature, I plan to do this. Conspiracy theories and truths. <clears throat> to better, better understand the subject, we will look at the following as study cases and see how they fit or do not fit into the broader picture of what I will say from the Qur'an or you can say guidance within the Qur'an of how to look at issues, which is what I think uh, many people have not been able to do and as a result, we, we shift our focus from Islamic eschatology into conspiracy theories. Okay, So we'll look at 9-11, we'll look at the Iraq war, we'll look at COVID-19, we'll look at the flat earth, we'll look at Islamophobia and UFOs, uh, what's happening with the UFOs as kind of like a study case as I discuss these principles of how to think about issues, particularly in this time and age where it's uh, maybe becoming harder for people to uh, understand what is really true and what is not really true and how to navigate that whole phenomenon. The first thing I want to start off with, one of the tricks of shaitan is to get our eyes off of the better to the less better or from the good towards what is not so good. In other words, <clears throat> a lot of what has happened uh, from what I'm seeing around me and uh, I understand that, you know, my voice is a minority voice and it is what it is. But the focus, instead of being on Islamic eschatology, it slowly shifts into conspiracy of all sorts. And to some degree, that is natural. But to another degree, you have to ask yourself, is this shaitan? causing me to move from something that is actually prophetic and something that is important into something that is not important. And so it's very important to be cognizant of why am I looking at this conspiracy theory? Why is this so important? Is it really that important? Right? Uh, how did J.F. Kennedy get killed? Is it important or not important? Right and any other conspiracy theories that are there, do they fit with what I want to know as a Muslim? Do they fit with the plan of me having my fatwa, my manhood, establishing Islamic chivalry, establishing Islamic, uh, you can say manhood, establishing uh, my Islamic character, my fatwa, my taskia? How does it fit? What is, does my jama'ah need to know about this? Do I need to know about this during my hijrah phase? Do I need to know about this 
at, when I establish a type of Medina after the Hijra phase with my Jama'ah? Will I have to know about this when we are in a state of jihad and defending Islam or going to the Mahdi? So you have to understand the priorities. It's called fiqh al-awliyat, the fiqh of understanding priorities. And <clears throat> unfortunately, when some people become interested in the less important, then they pull everyone to that less important thing. Okay, point number two. The Qur'an and the Prophet tell us of events that will occur before the final hour. Meaning, they are those events that the Prophet told us that are meaningful to us. If it has to do with guidance, if it has to do with haq and batil, if it has to do with truth and falsehood, if it has to do with what is right and what is wrong, if it has to do with guidance that you will need towards the end of days, then it has to be there by the Prophet ﷺ. And if you don't find the Qur'an or the Prophet speaking specifically to those events in the end of times, but you feel that it is important for some reason, then you really have to question yourself, is it really that important? Because the deception is at all levels, as I will soon explain. A sense of map of events of the past, the future based upon the Quran and the Sunnah, this is a precondition to understanding any conspiracy theories. Let me share with you one example of what I mean. The Prophet said, <clears throat> The Prophet gave an entire history of the Muslims from the beginning to the end. First there will be prophethood, he said. And then there will be khilafa ala min haj al khilafa on the footsteps of the Prophet. Then there will be kingship, which was the Umayyad and the Abbasid and the Ottomans and the Mughal Empire and so on and so forth. Then Mulkan Jabriyan, then there will be colonialism and imperialism. Then there will be khilafa after that. These ahadiths and many other that give you the big picture of Islam. Where is Islam? Where was Islam? Where is Islam going? Where are the Muslims going? What guidance do you get from you? Get, well, do you have a big picture in mind? Do you have a big picture in the mind? Do you know the history of Banu Israel and how it relates to the history of Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Because the Prophet said you will follow them hand span by hand span. So the things that they did you will do. They're important to understand. Uh, in fact, I should have written that point about uh, this big picture specifically with Bani Israel, but there are many traditions of the Prophet that give you the big picture. Do you have a big picture? If you don't have a big picture, then you're going to be lost in the leaves of the forest and you will be not be able to find your way. Okay. Now, <clears throat> part of Islamic eschatology is that Muslims will be weak. The enemies of Islam will hurt the Muslims. Islam will go back to the way uh, that it was. So that is part of there, and we need to understand that, uh, how Islam will be hurt, and how does that relate to conspiracy theories if it does. The Dajjal has to do with deception. So again, we're interested in the plotting and planning that the Quran mentions over and over again, because, you know, there's, uh, you can say, uh, one group of Muslims, they want to put a close, they want to close their eyes as if everything is the way it is and everything is the way it's supposed to be and everything is just great and let's just move forward and there is no conspiracy and you guys that talk about conspiracy are completely crazy. Okay, that's one. And the other is that every little thing that you find as a conspiracy, you're, you're putting your, your ears and your time and your energy into it and that is also not good. The jal has to do with deception. Islamic eschatology does not leave anything important out in terms of guidance or truth and falsehood. And the Prophet has made this clear. Meaning those issues that connect to the Quran and Sunnah when it comes to Islamic eschatology and the plotting and planning of things or the conspiracy of things have more importance than those that do not. Okay, uh, Like for example... I'm going to take Circus 19 as an example. The Prophet said, وسلم, that Masih al Dajjal will not enter Medina nor a, uh, nor a plague. Okay. So, what was uh, this Circus 19 doing in Medina? Okay. Why were they standing six feet apart in Medina? So, 
you know two things from here. Number one, there's a relationship between Ta'un and Ad-Dijjal. The, because Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, who is the true Messiah, was a healer. And uh, Dijjal will also act as a healer. And so there is a relationship between the Messiah coming back and him bringing diseases that he will then cure. Allahu A'lam. But this is what the tradition, and one can say based upon this tradition, look, there were all these COVID cases, circus 19 cases in Saudi Arabia, in Medina, and the Prophet said the plague will not enter Medina. Now I have tried to connect a saying of the Prophet ﷺ that is authentic in Bukhari with events that are happening. And I can say, well, this does not make common sense. No one had to tell me. That's another very important point. Is that no one had to tell me when 9-11 happened or when Circus 19 happened that this is a, a plot. Okay. No one had to do that. I knew it by my own understanding of the world. It was automatic. So there is a difference between the in, the information that I come to a conclusion of myself. No one had to tell me or convince me. I looked, I was living in the world that I was living in and I was like, okay, this does not make sense. And I said, this does not make sense and let me see what can I find in the Quran and the Hadith. So for example, in the Quran, Many people know I talked about the number 19. That number 19 is a fitna. And we call this Circus 19. Just like 9-11 and the 19 hijackers. And recently the 19 people who got arrested in uh, the Gaza Strip. So there is the, the WHO, the World Health Organization Committee of 19 people. So there's something I felt. Is it qat'i? Is it absolute proof? Is that what we call absolute proof? Not 19 of this or 19 of that? No. No one would say that's absolute proof, which I'm going to come to. It is the dhanni. But when you have enough of these added up as an aggregate, it becomes something. A strong proof. A strong evidence. Okay? So, how uh, do I uh, understand the world around me? Islamic eschatology does not leave anything important out, meaning those issues that connect to the Quran and Sunnah have more importance than those that do not. So, one was the number 19 of Circus 19. One was this plague would not enter Medina. So wait, I think this is confusing. I can myself come to the conclusion that this is some sort of uh, plot against uh, the world and the Muslims. And when I'm going to be... And the opposite of that is when there is propaganda. So now let me first start by a rule of truth is a rule of truth versus what's not true. True, true has to, truth has to be true from many angles. Like the four birds of Musa uh, of Ibrahim. Remember when Ibrahim والسلام, said to Allah, uh, الموتى, How do you give life to the dead? And Allah said, Do you not believe? And he said, Yes, Allah, I believe, but I want. I want tranquility in my heart. So how? So he said, Khud arbata, take four of the birds. And so I took from that ayah that from in my life, whenever I will decide upon an issue, something has to be true from four completely different angles. Why? Because anything can be true from any one perspective. Like I could say, for example, uh, six, six, is, six is a symbol of Satan because the Bible says so. That's the mark of the beast. Because where? That's one proof. Do I have a second proof? Do I have a third proof? Do I have a fourth proof? If I don't, I put that to the side. Okay. I understand 666 as something Shaitan will use to fool the people. <coughs> but the point is that something has to be true from four completely different perspectives because truth is true from many perspectives, while falsehood will appear to be true from one perspective. I'll give you an example. Homosexuality or the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Israelis can harp on the same, same, same 
thing. This is our land because it was our forefathers. This is our land because it was our forefathers. And they can talk about this or homosexuals will say, well, this is how I feel. But when you look at, for example, homosexuality from a relationship point of view, the 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 cost it costs to society in terms of AIDS and dealing with HIV, uh, the suicide rates, right? Uh, this is not man was not evolved this is not moving in the natural direction of reproduction right so i have many different i can come from an economic perspective i can come from a biological perspective i can come from a sociological perspective i can come from even a genetic perspective when it comes to the argument that has more truth to it is the argument that will be true from more perspectives and the argument that is not true from many many different perspectives but what does Batil do? Batil keeps repeating the same thing like news over and over again, over and over again, same thing, the same point over and over again. You know, so the uh, the Israelis will say, well, there's many Arab lands. Why don't you just go there? This is our land. We're small people. Give us our land. And it kind of builds upon that. Okay. The point being truth has is true from many perspective. Falsehood is true maybe from seemingly one or two perspectives. So you have to have at least, this is my yardstick for myself, meaning I will not open my mouth, in public especially, about something unless I have four solid, completely different reasons for why I'm saying what I'm saying. That's just my personal rule, okay? And I take it from when Ibrahim والسلام, asked Allah for proof that كيف تحيي الموت, how do you give life to the dead? What's the proof? So Allah gave him four birds. A rule of truth versus what is not true. True is true from many angles. And falsehood may be true from one angle. Okay. Knowing how propaganda works is an extremely important subject. Uh, if you look at Noam Chomsky's book, uh, uh, Manufacturing Consent, and there are other people who have written on this subject. But these, this is an extremely important subject. Because if you don't know how propaganda works, then you will not know what is a conspiracy. Okay. And a conspiracy, <clears throat> you know, like one of the mistakes people make, for example, if you take the, and I'm not trying to make fun of my brothers. I'm just trying to teach what I understand. But when something is no longer something that is de by definition no longer hidden, then it is not a conspiracy. So, for example, if you say the earth is flat, Okay, so all the space agencies in the world, not just the government agencies, because there are, there are almost hundreds of agencies working with them. All the sea pilots, all the sea captains, all the GPS workers, all the uh, people that, that are working in the airline industry, right? Um, and you can go on and make a whole list of the number of people that would be involved in a conspiracy saying, hiding the fact that the earth is actually flat, right? And... Uh, when there's too many people, it's it's not a conspiracy, okay? Uh, it has to be a bias. Even propaganda is not necessarily always intentional. It could just be a bias. It could be an institutional bias that lends towards a certain viewpoint. Okay, so let me just uh, continue with what I got here. Knowing how propaganda works is extremely important. And when you understand where, how propaganda works and why propaganda works, it's because of money. And so you have to follow the money. I'm going to talk about that. Camera just happens to be there. So the camera just happened to be, right? The camera just happened to be there looking at the planes, right? Uh, coming into the building. It just happened to be there. And then so many other events like this, the camera just captures that, that crucial moment where uh, the cops killed somebody or uh, many different things that then beco become viral. But no one's thinking about why is this camera even facing this way? When all the news agencies have the same headline. Uh, if you notice that in this recent, uh, and I can give many examples of this, but in this recent event that happened in Gaza, everyone had the same headline. Exchange of fire, exchange of fire, exchange of fire, exchange of fire. Okay, uh, let me see if I can actually uh, show that to you very quickly. Uh, Gaza exchange. So, 
So when you see similar headlines and all of a sudden all the news groups are saying the same thing, they're pushing the same thing, okay? Israel and Gaza militants exchange fire. Uh, Israel, and this is, you know, different news agencies, PBS. Israel and Gaza militants exchange fire. Fox News. Israel, Gaza militants exchange fire. Israel, uh, uh, Roundup. I Israel, Gaza exchange fire. Continues, okay? India Outlook, okay? Uh, Gaza militants in this other, Israel, Gaza militants exchange fire. You see this? Okay, so, uh, uh, AP News, Palestinian attacker shot, Israel, Hamas, change fi exchange fire. So what you see is that when there is a script that everyone is running on, then that usually is a sign that it's a propaganda. It's a propaganda machine at work, and everyone has a very, you know, the media within a certain framework is free to be like a free media, right? Uh, if they're going to report on some actor or some basketball player and their life or something, it's fine. But there's certain things that the media wants to promote and social engineer. So you become a better consumer and that, so because they own, own you. Or they want to create social engineering programs to even own you more. Okay. So... Uh, Camera just happens to be there. All the news agencies have the same headline. All the news agencies are all of a sudden talking about the same topic. Why would all the agencies talk about the same to and compete on the same topic when they should be actually looking for better and better topics? To each agency should really be talking about things that other people are not because there's so much happening in the world, but that's not how it works. How the media is treating the issue. Social media is the new media, and this is something that, you know, and, and by, by the way, when there's a propaganda, there's always a phantom enemy. You have to create some Hitler or Saddam Hussein or some, some person, some boogeyman that, you know, you, you create a, a, an enemy of. Now, social media is the new media. I mean, just look at the fact that YouTube, you can just get normal TV from YouTube now. That means that there's an alliance there of some sort. Now, social media works very, because people have the stats and they know how people work. And the prophet told us that, you know, people are not going to be trusting of each other. So they know people who are institutionalized, people who are going to believe in Circus 19, who are going to believe in 9-11. There are people that are institutionalized in their institutions, in the bigger institutions. And then there are those people that are not institutionalized. They don't, they don't care about CNN and they don't trust CNN. They don't believe in the politicians. They don't trust the politicians. For them, they have the other outlets and other systems. That's how they created the Arab Spring, for example, if you study that. <clears throat> Creating thousands of Facebook accounts, saying we're going to have a rally over here, and then people actually come and do a rally and overthrow the government and so on and so forth. So the social media creates a new enemy. And sometimes the enemy is the media outlets itself. But it, there's, it, it's a controlled opposition, both sides. Okay? And so you have to be aware of, okay, it's one thing that if I looked at, you know, Circus 19 and said to myself, wait, that doesn't make sense. And it's one thing if I looked at a plane hit a building, I'm like, okay, that doesn't make sense. But it's a different thing that if I'm on the uh, YouTube videos and it's you, you're listening to Christians, New Age people talking about, for example, flat earth. And then you're like, oh, well, this makes sense without. And this is very important. This is the problem is that people that listen to the flat earthers never paid that much a time to paying attention to the other side. And had they done, they wouldn't have been flat earthers, but they didn't because they were already anti-authoritarian. They didn't trust the system. They already know they're being lied to. They're being deceived. And now that deception becomes a deception that you have to be careful of because now they can use, they are, I mean, they now have robots doing propaganda on YouTube, on social media. You know, robots will forward messages 500 times or so. Uh, the robots will write messages, just like when you go to those websites and then the pop-up comes up and says, you know, you want to buy something and it's, may I help you? It's not a human being, it's a robot. So they're playing both, they're, they're playing the people who 
agree with the who believe in the institutions as they are and they're also playing with the people who don't trust the institutions as they are and you know how you can tell is you can tell if the media is if the institutionalized media is playing that is play is talking about it right so you can pick up on okay for example uh does the media talk about flat earth is it rising as a cult as a as a as a movement okay why? I mean, you got to ask yourself, why is it rising as a movement? And the other thing that I didn't write here that is very, very important, that when you are looking at anything, you have to look at the Sanad. You know what Sanad is? Where does the original source of this come from? So, for example, and again, I'm not trying to bash. I'm trying to explain something that's factual, whether one agrees or not. This is what I'm saying is factual. That if the source is, for example, CNN, well, then I know the reality of that. If somebody is on YouTube and he's promoting an idea of somebody that is himself, that, that idea evolved, number one, in England, the flat earth idea, came from England, and we know about the island of the Jad. Okay? This is the same island that gave birth to what? To feminism, to the modern world banking system. This is the same a place that gave birth to the scientific revolution. This is the same place that gave birth to Hollywood, even. This is the same place. You can go on. So the flat earth is just part of that. Uh, you know, so you have to go back and see, okay, this flat earth idea that as I am, not, not because you can't say, oh, flat earth in Quran says flat earth. No, that's because that's a, there was no ice cap in that flat earth. There was no, um, black sun in that flat earth there was none of that in that flat earth so this person what he is talking about is something specific so if you don't look at the sun of things so for me i'm going back to this sun okay and this samuel robotham whatever his name is was born in england uh that's a question mark and he wrote a book on zet zetetic astronomy the earth is not a globe Okay, under a pseudonym. Okay, and then today, after 200 years, this guy's ideas are becoming promoted and pushed. Why? Why? Tell me why. Tell me why this idea, this person's ideas are being pushed. Okay, and so, uh, the, and then, okay, so let me just, uh, go back here. So there's always a phantom enemy, whether it is Saddam Hussein or NASA, so on and so forth. And it becomes, and is it is it generating funds? Is it making money? What is it doing? Okay. One of the big issues now is because of facade being the whole issue of using trust and broken trust as a method to create propaganda at both levels. Right? This is what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How and so when the prophet said this, do you think that they don't know our media is no longer trusted? That CNN is not having that many viewers compared to news being watched on YouTube? Of course they do. So they know what's going on. And if they really didn't want people to listen to Flat Earth, you know, they would have done it. How social media is being used for propaganda. In fact, social media is the new media. YouTube subscription to TV is an example, they're aligned together. Follow the money, right? Sutul Kahaf is all about materialism, money. How does it fit the bigger picture? This is very important. Again, I'm, uh, whatever you think is important, does it fit that bigger picture I told you about when the Prophet said, okay, these are the phases of the Islamic history, or that you will follow the Jews hand span by hand span. How does what you think is important, how does it fit into the bigger picture? as a conspiracy are the conspiracies that are conspiracies we don't even know about that there were of course the only ones that we would be concerned with okay are the ones the prophet or the quran mentioned those are the marker issues those are the real issues right everything if the prophet didn't mention that uh such and such thing would become happen and we make that our biggest issue then that would be an injustice to the Muslim community. Uh, follow the money. How does it fit with the bigger picture? Very important point. Like, for example, uh, let's say Circus 19. 
Does that fit in the bigger picture of what we see in the future? Is there going to be, is that going to create, has that been able to create more facade, more starvation, more poverty? Is that moving in the direction that, uh, that the prophet has predicted? Does it have a connection to Babylon or Talmud? Is it connected to Messianic prophecies? Right? So, for example, so for example, part of the Messianic prophecies is the world would be flat before the Messiah comes. And so, while the rabbis of Talmud argued about the size of the flat earth, the Greeks had already determined the earth to be a sphere and calculated circumference and had moved on to consider, to consider other questions. Okay, so the point being that Jewish people until the 1960s uh, thought the world was flat. Okay, and this has to do with uh, a lot to do with their uh, Messiah coming back. The rabbis of the Talmud were following a long-held belief that the world is flat, which we can trace all the way back to the earliest known map found in Babylon and made in the 6th century BC. It shows a flat disk like earth surrounded by waters. And that is the picture most people had because, well, that's what it looks like to us. But anyway, the point being that where are you, what is your sanat? What is your, uh, what it, where is your, inf like a hadith goes back to the Prophet. It's supposed to go back to the Prophet. The Quran is going back to the mouth of the Prophet. What is your sanad? Okay, is your sanad a Muslim scientist? Is your sanad uh, uh, a misinterpretation? Well, we'll talk about that one day, not right now. Okay, uh, marker points should be based upon Islamic eschatology. This is another very important point, which is that, okay, one is to have a overview picture of what will happen throughout the history from beginning to end from the time of the prophet to the end of uh, the world and then in its different phases but you have to also be aware of within your context what are the key issues that you are expecting to happen or that you see beginning to happen so for example the return of the jews back to israel that's a big marker the rise of jerusalem that's a big marker. Does your conspiracy have to do with those? For me, for example, the flat earth issue has to do with that because they have to make the earth flat before the Messiah comes back. So, but the people that, Muslims that say the earth is flat, what, how does that fit into the bigger picture? Okay. Uh, also beware of giving too much importance to Bible prophecies and things like 666. Yes, it can be a secondary source for something, but it's not a primary anything. It's not a proof for anything. A cult, and Shaitan, in fact, will use 666 to fool us. The occult numbers are important when they fit the Quran. Otherwise, all numbers are from Allah. Don't let Shaitan own something that is not his. Like, for example, saying SubhanAllah 33 times. These this number is these numbers are not primary proofs okay they can be secondary tertiary when you see a pattern for example the one eye media in the media when you see people looking at everything with the one eye or you see the pyramid in different places again when you see a pattern sometimes it can be a very strong proof sometimes it can be a secondary proof but what are you looking for you're looking primarily for patterns that's what a conspiracy is going to be a pattern or a cluster of pattern. Ideas that existed in the Muslim world for hundreds of years have a validity, which means, and this is very important, because to deny what the Muslims have done throughout their history is to deny tradition. And to deny tradition is exactly what it means to be modern. You're no different from a Quranist, for example, who denies the hadith of the Prophet, who denies tradition, because why? He wants to fit into the liberal democracy so he's denying the hadith and so that he can conform the quran into what he likes the other of that is that what you deny all tradition because it's not fitting your own personal uh, feelings of what's happening in the world so denying tradition is a very big problem okay postmodernity is a very big problem Rise of fake science without rejection of science of Muslim civilization. So, you know, yeah, COVID-19, fake science. Okay. Uh, flat Earth, fake science. Okay. 
You can't reject what the Muslim civilization has already established as true. Look for contradiction at the bird's eye view. For example, let's take the flat earth example again. I'm sorry because that because that fits into a lot of these paradigms of why it's problematic. So on the one side, you will say, if the Jal wants humans and jinns to go into space, why would they give the wrong shape to the earth, right? So, you know, the uh, person who had the dream with the Jal uh, person, uh, I think his name is, uh, you know, he talked about the Jal came to him and he told him to uh, Jack Parsons, okay? He is the father of the space, space, space age. Without womb, we would not be able to launch satellites into space. Okay. And he was an occultist. And so, on, so this person is taught by, uh, you know, uh, Dijal, or Dijal comes to him in a dream and says, and we know this is the 13th ayah, that there is an occult aspect to this to go into space. And most likely because when you look at the Quran, the jinns could no longer listen to what was happening in heavens. And they were kicked out of the heavens. And they want to go back to heavens. And so they want to sit where they used to sit and listen to the angels. And uh, then be able to uh, affect humanity even more. But the point being that if you say that the jinns have an agenda to go to this space then you can't say that they're working with human beings, giving them the wrong shape of the earth, right? That would be a contradiction. So when you're looking at issues, and this is my main point, is you have to think for a while and unbiased and not listening to only one side, but both sides when you're not sure. Only when, you know, it's like istikhara. I'll give you an example. When you do istikhara, you're not sure. They say mayor here and they say no mayor. I, mean, I don't know. We do istikhara. When you're in that state, when you're not sure, instead of just pursuing where your heart and your desires and your ego is taking you, you're supposed to pause and say, okay, this is where I need guidance because I don't want my ego to take me the wrong way. And so this is where you need to do istikhara or listen to both sides properly, looking for contradictions as a bird's eye view. For example, if the Jal wants humans to go to space, why would they give the wrong shape of the earth? When you're trying to understand conspiracies and how it relates to eschatology, look for predictability and math and patterns. Look for, is this a possibility or is it a probability? Gray areas in the Quran. So now let me just share with you, there are obviously going to be some gray areas. The areas that you're not 100% sure about. Okay, so... uh. Let me share with you one example of that, okay? And then let me know in the comment section what you think about this particular gray area. I'm calling it a gray area. For me, it's not a gray area because it's, but it's connected with Quran. And so I want to share this with you so that you can see that things are not always black and white. There's some things in the middle and some things, and always when there are things in the middle, it means you're doing a certain level of interpretation and uh, that interpretation could be right, could be wrong, and Allah knows best. And so, uh, let's now look at uh, this gray area example. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, The hour has drawn near and the moon was split. Of course, this is referring to the event of the Prophet sallam, splitting the moon. But, could be part of Islamic eschatology that the hour has come near and the moon was dug. Okay, the moon was instead of split because shaqqa literally means to cut into or split, and it could also mean to dig into, as I will show you. Now, if I say the humanity did go to the moon, what's the proof of that? They will, the proof of that is the Quran says the hour has come near and the moon was dug or the moon was split, you may say, no, that's a wrong interpretation. But it is a valid interpretation. I mean, you don't have to agree, but you can say, you have to say, well, the Arabic says, seems to say this. Okay. If we do not have the story of the prophet pointing to the moon and splitting the moon, then 
if you just look at the linguistic wordings of the word of the Quran, iktarabat al-sa'a, the hour has come near, wa anshaqqa al-qamar, and the moon has been split or has been opened up. And that's how we got the moon rocks. I say to someone that the proof that the Day of Judgment is near is that man went to the moon. And the proof is, the Quran says this. And I say, look, I show a Christian, وَإِنْ يَرَوْ آيَةً And if we show you a miracle, that the Quran talked about this event of man going to the moon, يُعْرِضُوا They will turn away, يَقُولُوا سِحْرٌ مُسْتَمِرٌ They'll say this is just continuous magic. Okay? Now, let me give you another uh, example of this. This is from the meaning perspective. You can look at it. It means to cleave, to burst asunder, to break, to tear, to rip, to dig, to slit, to, in, to put an incision, to ensign, to be slashed, to be claved. All these meanings are part of shakka. Okay? And uh, then... If you look at, for example, the hour has come near and the moon has split, it also talks about the uh, the the number of ayahs. Okay, uh, what are the the number of ayahs would be exactly meaning the year we went to the moon was in 1389 Hijri. 1389 Hijri. What are the odds that there would be exactly 1,389 verses after the moon verse? Okay. That that verse could have been any number, okay? The year of the moon landing, okay, is the same number as the, as that. And then what is it? Fifty four one, okay. And now, if you also look at, uh, if you look at the LM departed moon, right? Uh, it will then uh show you. Let me show you this. So it's as Surah fifty four. Ayah 1, right? And then what time were they there at the moon? It was 54 minutes and 1 second. So you can disagree, but the one who will do that well using this ayah and saying we went to the moon, well, he has a point. He could be it could be valid. It could be a gray area. It could be absolutely perfectly what Quran is saying that the Quran predicted man going to the moon. Right? And if you want to further analyze that, does Quran say people can't go to the moon? So just, uh, and then I want to uh, make connect this with another issue, which is that if you are not sure about something, or if you want to study something, then it is what very important to look at that thing from a Quranic perspective. So for example, if I want to know does man have the ability to, in according to Quran, to go to the moon? What does Quran say for that? So, uh, Allah says, "Sahara laku ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard." Allah has made subservient to you whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Jami and minhu, all of it is open to you. Okay, Allahu ladi sahara laku al bahr Allah has made the oceans subservient to you. Sahara shamsa wal qamar. Allah has made the sun and the moon subservient to kullu yajri ila ajalin musamma. They're all moving to their appointed times. And Allah says about everything Allah has put, anna Allah sahara lakum ma fi samawat. Don't you see? Alam tara? Do you not see? Allah has made subservient to you whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Alam tara anna Allah sahara lakum ma fi al-ard. And Allah says, do you not say Allah has made subservient to you whatever is on earth? Uh, and you can go on. And so, does the Quran say that we can't go to the moon? No. It seems to suggest we could. But did we? It's a whole different issue. Is And if somebody says we did, is it a lie? Okay. If, uh, then you can also look at things from its historical perspective. Russia had sent out its uh, thing into the orbit and America was in competition with Russia because of the Cold War. America had to make some desperate moves. If Russia thought going to the moon was a lie, they would have said something, etc., etc. We can continue with the arguments. But I'm just simply saying, it doesn't matter what you believe. What matters is how you think. Do you use Quran for your thinking? 
Do you pick up the key words you're thinking about and say, okay, what does Quran say about this? Okay, if you don't pick up Quran and you're just listening to YouTube videos of Christians or New Age people, that's not going to take you very far, I'm sorry to say. Does the Quran say people can't go to the moon? Now, there's a difference between rational and irrational versus empirical thought, which I don't want to spend too much ta time talking about. But I'll only say rational thought is any thought that can come into your mind without a contradiction. For example, I can rationally imagine there's a unicorn in the sky. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. Is it empirically true? No, because I can't see it. I can't touch it. I can't feel it. I can't put it in a lab. It's not true. Uh, is it? Uh, if it's is is it irrational? No, it's not irrational because I can imagine it without contradiction. Irrational would be like a square circle. Can it be a square and a circle at the same time? So you have to be able to categorize your thoughts between is it rational? Is it irrational? Is it empirical? And you have to focus on the Quranic keywords for what you're looking for. Okay. For example, I'll give you another example. Somebody can say, this is another gray area. Somebody can say, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But for example, if you look at the uh, verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَيْنَمَا تَكُونُوا يُدْرِكُكُمُ الْمَوْتِ Wherever you are, death will come to you. وَلَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُنُوجٍ مُشَيِّدًا Even if you were in, in, in tall towers that were protected, وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ حَسَنَةٌ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ And if something good comes to them, they say this from Allah. وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ سَيِّئَةٌ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِكَ And if something bad comes to them, they say this is from you. قُلْ O Prophet, tell them, صلى الله عليه وسلم, كُلُّ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ All of this, everything is from Allah. Okay? So let me just give you the Whatever, wherever you may be, death will overtake you. Even if you, were, if, if you should be within towers of lofty construction. Okay, so is this referring to 9-11 or indication of 9-11, right? So the point is maybe, maybe not. But you must go primarily to the Qur'an first and then the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, you'll be making your life difficult. <clears throat> okay, now let's go back. Uh, was it common sense? that told us or that something is wrong with the events of 9-11 or it was somebody else telling me that could be part of a propaganda or part of some occult that was telling me that this is wrong. Number 19, is this absolute proof of something? No. Number 19 is not absolute proof, but it's strong proof when added as an aggregate to other types of proof. The role of true science and discoveries in Islamic eschatology. Over here also, uh, I want to share with you that uh, what does the Qur'an say about um, discoveries and the heavens and the earth? And uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is part of Islamic eschatology that you have to be aware of. Sanurihim, we will show them. Ayatina, our signs, fil afaq, in the horizons, not horizon. Quran doesn't, because if it's a flat earth, there's only one horizon. But if it's a round earth, it has to be horizons, because when it is sunset, uh, in fact, in fiqh, they have a, you know, they have, they, dis they describe in Islamic law that if somebody died at sunset and another person died at sunset, who will be inheriting for who, depending upon whose sunset came first? Many different horizons, okay? Not one horizon. But anyway, that's not even the point. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq. We will show them our signs in the horizons. Wa fi anfusihim and in themselves. Hatta until we will keep showing them the signs until hatta yatabayyan until it's absolutely clear annahul haq that this is absolutely true. <sighs> right? So Allah will show you the signs. Allah will show who the signs. Sanurihim. We will show them, meaning the non-Muslims, the discoveries of the signs of Allah will happen in their hands. This was an eschatological statement that has come true. And Allah will continue to give them the signs that you can benefit from. But Allah will give them the signs. So, him ayatina. We will show them our signs. Fil afaq in the horizons. Wa fi anfusim. And in themselves. Hatta yatabayyana anna, anna hula. 
حتى 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 يتبين لهم أنه الحق. Until it's absolutely clear to them, this is حق. This is absolutely truth. We will keep sending our signs until Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes down. And there will be bigger and bigger and bigger signs. And there will be signs in the horizons and in themselves. So this process is happening. So to say that this process is not happening is to then to, to, to question. Or you would have to reinterpret uh, the meaning of this verse. That Allah is saying we give them. And so let me show you. We will show them our signs in the heavens and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this Qur'an is the truth. Okay, so the role of science or the signs of Allah or the phenomenon of nature as a sign of Allah and discoveries in Islamic eschatology, that is there. Now, not all proof is qat'i, not all proof is absolute. Some proof is dhanni, that you feel there's an indication of something. But if you feel there's an indication of something, it's not qat'i, it's not a absolute. So if you feel, and this is another point, is that when we are making points about something, let's say science, okay, or it cannot go against our tradition, it can add to our tradition. Like I can study the Qur'an and say something no one said before that adds to the Qur'an. But I can't take away from the halal and the haram and the all the things our tradition has been saying for 1,000 years. The, the you know, uh, the direction of the qibla cannot change. So like that, okay. Why, which is why you need a cluster of at least four, completely four different perspectives for the same issue before you finally say that this must be the truth. You have to ask yourself, do is what I'm thinking or is what these people or whatever information is coming to me does it contradict Quran does it contradict our tradition does it confirm or negate either of the two is there a pattern a script that is being followed does it fit into the big picture everything is a matter of degrees if meaning everything is nothing is 100% you could say yes probability it's much more closer to being qat'i absolute Understanding and also in this whole big picture, part of understanding the philosophical basis of secularism, liberal democracy, the the renaissance that happened, the Christian reformation that happened, understanding the capitalistic riba system is all very helpful and, and, and helps understand how things are going to progress into the future when it comes to things like the Great Reset, the increased pronouns of he, she, they and it and all that. Okay, so where does the great reset fall in this? Okay, so now based upon what I said, what does the Quran do you think say about this? Does the Quran say something about this? I feel the Quran does say something very clearly about this. Uh, how does the U UFOs fall into this picture? Right, all of a sudden everyone talking about, oh, all these famous people talking about UFOs and all these famous people talking about flat earth. It's all connected. So uh, to me, Okay, so I hope inshallah this helps to map out how we need to think about things in order to be more productive. So you have to have a filter of priorities and you have to have a filter that looks at the sun of the things. You have to ask it, you have to ask yourself, okay, what is the keywords that I'm thinking about and let me see what Quran says about them. Let me understand the historical context of things. Do I see the big picture of things? Right? Uh, do I understand how propaganda works? Uh, do I understand uh, the Muslim tradition when it comes to all of this? So all the and 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 so this talk of mine for the people that are serious, they should listen to it more than once because uh, you have to make this part of your thinking process, right? You have to make this part of your thinking process. Islam is not a joke. It's something serious. It's not something you listen to on YouTube uh, from people that are not even Muslims and you're spending more time listening to them than you're even trying to understand what the Quran says about a certain subject. And you don't look at that subject from uh, all of its different perspectives. And like I said, the truth is true really only when you're able to show that it's true from many different perspectives. You can say, okay, from a sociological perspective, this is why it's wrong. From a biological perspective, this is why it's wrong, right? 
What's wrong with the idea of, for example, feminism? Well, the idea of feminism has some good parts to it, for sure. That women have been abused in history and sold in catalogs in the West, yes. But uh, will a family unit work well without uh, a leader in the household? You know, and and then you can uh, bring out the nature of look at the hormones and the brain makeup Allah made for the women and the brain makeup Allah made for the men. So you can then begin to see, okay, wait, this may have one argument, but the other side has a lot more arguments. Not only that, it's in human nature. Look at every rom romantic story, right? The the wife, the girl, wants to follow her husband. That's the human nature, right? So anyway, that, I'm not trying to say that sisters don't have a legitimate reason to complain sometimes or many times, especially now, because we lost, forgot about the prophet in his character. And, you know, so I'm hoping that, uh, let me just go over this one last time very quickly because I'm hoping that, inshallah, this will be a map for you to keep in your mind. To better understand the subject, we will look at the following study cases. This is how I started. One of the tricks of shaitan is to get our eyes off what is better to what is not as good. The Prophet told us of the events before the final hour, so our eyes should be focused on that. A sense of map of the events of the past in the future should be there. Okay, This is a precondition to understand any conspiracy theories. Part of Islamic eschatology is that Muslims will be weak, and there will be enemies of Islam. The jal means is, has to do with deception. Islamic eschatology does not leave out anything important because the, Allah gave us everything we needed for our guidance. The rule is that you have to have at least four solid proofs from four different perspectives. Understanding how propaganda works. Camera just happens to be there. All news agencies have the same headlines. How is the media treating the issue? Is all the media saying the same thing all of a sudden? Social media and the new is the new media. Okay, is there a phantom enemy here? Uh, one of the big issues now is because of facade using trust and broken trust as a method to create propaganda at both levels. Those, uh, those that believe in the institutions and those that don't believe in the institutions any longer, then they have different ways of doing propaganda to each. So you'll find, for example, you know you'll find, for example, headings that say uh, flat earthers were less prone to believe in COVID-19. So they've already made this connection. How social media is being used for propaganda. In fact, social media is the new media. Okay. Uh, follow the money. That's another way. Who owns the media, for example? And that's a good question, right? It can be looked up. Sutul Kahf, which talks about materialism. How does it fit the bigger picture? Does it have a Talmudic or a Babylon connection? Is it connected to Messianic prophecies? These are questions you have to ask yourself. Marker points should be based on Islamic eschatology. Okay, what are the things you're looking at? Uh, you're looking at uh, the return of the Jews to Israel. You're looking at the rise of Jerusalem. Again, how does it fit into the bigger picture? Bible prophecy, you have to be careful. Occult numbers are important when they fit the Quran. Otherwise, all numbers belong to Allah. And I'm not going to let shaitan deserve to have any number in his ownership. Okay, so there... Uh, when you see a pattern, okay, like the one eye in the media or the pyramid in the media, ideas that exist in the Muslim world for hundreds of years have a validity that you can't just simply reject. You can say, I, at the most, you can say, at the most, you can say, and over here, I want to make something clear, you know, that, <clears throat> let, let's take uh, an example of coffee. When coffee first came out, or even tea, when it first came out, Muslims said it's haram. So there were two paradigms. Some said it's haram, some said it's halal. But when there are two competing ideas in the Muslim world, one idea beat the other idea. Why? Because the Muslim scholars had coffee. And they said, wait, this can actually help me in my ibadah. This is what happened. This can actually, this doesn't alter my mind in any way. So there could be in the beginning, at one time, two competing ideas. There were two competing ideas not to put the Quran in a print form because the, 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 when it's printing, it's striking the book. And that was seen as a type of disrespect to the Quran. But overall, that's what won. Okay? In the same way, you had Muslims saying flat earth, you had Muslims saying round earth. But the round earth became a fully developed science. 
based upon spherical trigon trigonometry, based upon the Qibla directions, based upon being able to get uh, to try to estimate the distance from one city to the next, right? Became and flat earth went into the background. It was there in the beginning, but then what did the Muslims adapt? Right? Sabil al Mu'minin, the Quran says, the Ijma' was to go with the circle. This is a fact. This cannot, you know, the, the fully developed version of the round was able to predict the movement of the suns and the moon, was able to predict when the next solar eclipse will happen. So that was a fully developed system, whereas the flat earth has never been able to predict anything. So ideas that existed in the Muslim world for hundreds of years have a validity, which means to be modern is to be is to reject the tradition. That's a very pro big problem. Rise of fake science without rejection of sciences of the Muslim civilization. Understand that there is a rise of fake science. Why is there a rise of fake science? There's a rise of fake science for many reasons. Number one, first scientists used to be independent. Now scientists are paid by corporations or universities and their grants and their grant givers and so on and so forth. Just like media is controlled by corporations that pay for the ads. Look for contradictions at the bird eyes view, right? Is what you're saying, does it have a contradiction? Look for predictability, math, and patterns. Possibility versus probability. Think about, is this qat'i or dhanni? Is it absolutely true or is it possibly true? Is it dhanni or qat'i? Does the Quran say people, uh, no, rational thought versus irrational thought versus empirical thought? Focus on Quranic keywords. If you're thinking about an issue and you're not sure, is this, a, is this what, ask yourself, what does the Quran say about it? Go back to the Quran. I wonder, 9-11, uh, again, was it, it was it common sense that told you something is wrong here or somebody in YouTube had to do propaganda and tell you that something's wrong here? Number 19, if that has a number 19 connection, the role of true science and discoveries in Islamic eschatology. I talked about this. Which is why you need a cluster of proofs, at least four different proofs from four different perspectives. So you have to ask yourself, again, does it contradict the Qur'an? Does it contradict our tradition? Does it confirm or negate either of the two? Is there a pattern or a script? Right? Is it like part of common sense? Has humanity come to understand this as a fact, as a whole? Because if humanity understands something as a fact, well, it has some credence in it. Not completely. Because then Islam wouldn't be true, right? Is there a pattern or script? Does it fit the bigger picture of Islamic eschatology? Understanding the philosophical basis of secularism, liberal democracy, capitalism is very helpful. And its future into the re great reset and increased pronouns that I mentioned. Uh, so, leave in your comment section any other tools, mental tools, uh, cognitive tools you have for how would you be able to tell if something is a conspiracy or something is not a conspiracy. So let's see if we can build a list that includes things that I didn't mention uh, or forgot to mention when I was thinking about this. And uh, and then also, um, for the Great Reset, how do you understand that situation? And does that fall under conspiracy? Uh, does that fall under the big picture? Um, what about increased pronouns? Does that fall into the conspiracy or... Uh, some sort of agenda or uh, you can say social engineering program so <clears throat> inshallah i'm sorry if i offended someone but i thought it was important to uh, convey how to think about things now you don't think about things this way uh, which is what i've seen some people do uh, to give you um, a list of uh, islamic sources okay these people thought this way so just because then you have to, as long as soon as you agree that there are two sides within the Muslim framework, within the Islamic framework, there are two sides, right? Then you can't say it's qata, it's absolute. There's then the possibility any side is wrong. And so uh, really, if we leave things off at the Muslim world, we come to the geocentric model um, at, at the very least. Anyway, so I don't want to talk about that right now, but. So, inshallah, I hope this was helpful. I pray that Allah opens uh, our hearts and our minds and our sensitivity to understanding and recognizing uh, things that are propagandas and things that are schemed 
and things that have an agenda and uh, open our hearts and minds to be able to see what is haq versus batil uh, inshallah more easily jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh